Chapter twenty five of the Adventures of Joel Pepper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Adventures of Joel Pepper by Margaret Sidney. Chapter twenty five. Joel sells shoes for Mr. Beebe. The little doctor kept a firm hold on Joel's jacket and gazed keenly into his face. Um, he said. I wanted to, to help Polly, gasped Joel. Oh, dear me. He was a sight to behold, as the tears washed their way down the grimy face, which was still working fearfully as he tried to hold in his sobs. So you thought you'd help Polly, said Dr. Fisher kindly. Was that it, Joel? Yes, said Joel. She'd put the putty in and put it in and put the putty in repeated the little doctor aghast yes or ben had i never in all my life heard of burning putty in a stove said dr fisher helplessly and setting his big spectacles again as if that might possibly assist him to understand oh she didn't burn it cried joel just as much astonished well what did she do with it then demanded dr fisher Dear me, I always supposed a stove was meant to burn things in. And he waved his head helplessly and regarded Joel with a fixed stare. She stuck the putty in the holes, said Joel very distinctly. Don't you understand? Polly's stove is very old, and it's cracked, and she says the air comes in and then the fire goes down, so she has to stuff up all the mean old cracks. Oh, dear me, I wanted to help her. And off Joel went in another gust of tears. I suppose Polly feels badly over her stove sometimes, reflected Dr. Fisher, casting a very sharp glance on Joel. I really wonder if she does, he added carelessly. Feels badly, exploded Joel. Then he took a long look around on all sides and leaned over to whisper in the little doctor's ear. She cries sometimes, Polly does. No, exclaimed Dr. Fisher. Yes, she does, declared Joel, shaking his stubby head decidedly. She cries dreadfully when Mamsie isn't looking, and she didn't know that I saw her either. I only peeked behind the pantry door, and I wanted to, to help her. He began to cry afresh at the recollection. Joel, said Dr. Fisher, getting up suddenly, you've got to tell your mother how the little brown house got on fire. I know, said Joel, but his head drooped and his eyes fell. And the best way to right the wrong is to own up at once, said the little doctor. I suppose she's taught you that, eh, Joel? Yes, sir, said Joel. Well, when you've got such a mother as you have, Joel, continued Dr. Fisher, you better treat her as well as you know how. So run along and be quick with you. And Dr. Fisher gave him a resounding clap on the shoulder that sent Joel flying off like a shot from a gun while the little doctor stole off the back way and got into his gig and drove off as fast as he could and thus escaped being thanked and the badger town folks got together and held a meeting in mr atkinson's store that very evening and said that it was a pity that mrs pepper who was struggling so to bring up all those five children should have such a hard time so each man put his hand in his pocket and fished out some money and the carpenters came next day and mended up all the holes where the axe had cut through the roof, and the whole house was cleaned and dried where the water had run down, and then there was one dollar and forty-five cents left over, for people had been so very generous. "'Just keep it, Mrs. Pepper,' said the spokesman. "'Twill come in handy, most likely.' And Mrs. Pepper couldn't speak, she was so taken aback. But they didn't seem to feel as if they hadn't been thanked enough, so they all went back again into the village." Ben had been working in a distant woodlot for Deacon Bludgett, and so hadn't heard a word of the fire until he got into the village on his way home. Then he said he wouldn't believe it unless he should see for himself, so he ran every step of the way home and rushed in all out of breath. What happened? he demanded of the first person he met. This happened to be Polly. Oh, Ben, she exclaimed, flinging her arms around him, and then followed all the story. And Ben continued to blink every now and then up at the ceiling, varied by hurrying out to gaze at the roof when he would rub his eyes. Dear me, Polly, he would exclaim, it seems just like an awful dream. I wish it was, sighed Polly, 
and I guess Joel wishes so too. But the next day, when the Badger Town people came with their gift, then the five little peppers changed about to the very happiest children in the world. And as soon as the visitors had gone, the whole bunch of peppers just took hold of hands and danced like wild little things around the table where the pile of silver quarters and ten cent pieces lay. Mamsie, said Polly, when at last they stopped to take breath, did you ever know of such good people in the world as our Badger Town folks? I am sure I didn't, declared Mrs. Pepper, wiping her eyes. May the Lord reward them, for I'm sure I can't. Polly suddenly left the ring of peppers and came close to her mother. Perhaps you can sometime, Mamsie, she said soberly. I hope so, replied Mother Pepper. Well, look forward to it, and take the chance if it ever comes, you may be sure, Polly. That night, when the little brown house was still as a mouse, Polly heard a loud scream come peeling down from the room in the loft. Mrs. Pepper, strange to say, didn't hear it at all. Poor woman, she was very tired with her work, from which she had been hurried so unceremoniously when the alarm of fire reached her, and she had lain awake all the first part of the night with a heart burdened with anxious care. Joel's dreaming all about the fire, most likely, said Polly to herself. So she slipped on Mamsie's old wrapper, picking it up so that she would not trip and tumble on her nose as she sped softly over the stairs. Joel, hush, she said reprovingly. You'll wake Mamsie and Phronsie. Ben, do make him keep still. I can't, said Ben, only half awake. Hush up there, Joe. And he turned over a very sleepy face and tried to look at Polly. Tisn't me, said Joel in high dudgeon. I ain't afraid, cat. And Polly stared to see David sitting on the edge of the bed he shared with Joel and tucking up his feet well under him while he shook with terror as he cried shrilly, They're running all up my legs. Poor little thing, exclaimed Polly, sitting down on the other edge of the bed at the risk of getting on Joel's toes. He's frightened, to the others. I suppose you've been dreaming, Davy. No, no, cried Davy, huddling up worse than ever. There goes one of them now, he exclaimed suddenly and pointed toward Polly. He's just running under Mamsie's wrapper. Polly hopped off the bed in her liveliest fashion, while from under Mamsie's wrapper scuttered a black object over the bed quilt in the opposite direction. What is it? she cried, beginning to shake violently herself. Oh, dear me, are there any more of them? Yes, said Davy, there are lots and lots, Polly. Oh, dear me. He couldn't twist himself into a smaller knot than he was, so there he sat, as miserable as possible, with the tears rolling down his face. Joel, cried Polly, giving that individual a little poke in the back, as he appeared to be going off to sleep again. You can tell about these black things. I must know. So what is it? Let me go to sleep, grunted Joel, twisting away from her fingers. No said Polly firmly. I shan't, Joey Pepper. What are those black things that Davy— Oh, dear me, there is another one. And Polly hopped back upon the bed, for there was a second black creature steering straight for her in the dim light. Joel gave a long, restful sigh. Do let me alone, he said crossly. But Polly leaned over and shook his shoulder smartly. See here now, cried Ben, roused by all this. You just sit up in bed, Mr. Joel, and tell Polly all you know about this business. Do you hear? and suddenly overcame Ben's pillow flying through the air to tumble over Joel's chubby nose. "'Nothing to tell,' declared Joel again, but he sat up in bed. "'So you said before,' said Polly, "'but these black things got up here somehow, and you know all about it, I'm sure. So you've just got to tell all about it, Joel Pepper.' "'It's crickets,' blurted Joel suddenly, "'and Dave and me brought em to put in Ben's bed, and—' Thank you, interrupted Ben, and, oh, Davy, reprovingly said Polly. I'm sorry, said little Davy, wriggling up his toes. I didn't know they hopped so bad. Oh, Polly, they're all running on my legs, he cried with another burst. Never mind, said Polly, quite reassured. They're nothing but dear, nice little crickets. I don't care now, but it's dreadful to see black things in the middle of the night when you don't know what they are. I don't like em, Polly, wailed David. I'd rather they be out of doors. But you helped to bring em in, said Polly. How could you, Davy? she added reproachfully. Dave didn't exactly help, said Joel uneasily. I told him he'd got to go, Polly, he added honestly. Oh, I see, said Polly. 
well now davy you're going downstairs to get into mamsie's bed oh goody cried davy smiling through his tears and stepping gingerly out of bed on the tips of his toes lest he should meet a black cricket unawares he skipped to the head of the stairs shake your clothes called polly in a smothered voice fearful lest mamsie and phronsie should wake up thereupon she began to shake the old wrapper violently we mustn't carry any of em downstairs she said while joel set up a howl oh i don't want dave to go downstairs and leave me he whined yes you can stay up here with your crickets said polly coolly having shaken off any possibility of one remaining on mamsie's wrapper and tomorrow morning you just step around lively and pick em all up and carry em outdoors said ben before turning over for another nap good night polly good night ben said polly softly going downstairs after davy who was pattering ahead and good night joey good night sniffled joel oh dear me i don't want dave to go well anyway he ain't going away ever again polly pepper so there the next morning as soon as it was light enough to see them joel picked up all his crickets it was no easy matter for they made him an awful piece of work hopping and jumping into all the corners and just as soon as his thumb and fingers were on them away they were off again but ben had said everyone must go so joel kept at it until the perspiration just rolled from his tired hot face i don't like em polly he confided when the last one was escorted out of doors and i ain't ever gonna bring one in again i wouldn't joe said polly and it isn't nice to scare folks i think i think so too said phronsie with a wise nod of her yellow head as she sat on the floor playing with david think what phronsie cried joel suddenly what polly said replied phronsie patting seraphina who was being shown the pictures in a bit of old newspaper that david was pretending to read ho ho cried joel bursting into a laugh you don't know whatever you're talking about fron does she polly don't tease her said polly but phronsie didn't hear being absorbed in correcting seraphina who had wobbled over on her back instead of sitting up elegantly to view the pictures joel ran down the next day to see mrs beebe mother pepper giving the long desired permission davy had a little sore throat and he much preferred to stay near mamsie's chair now joe remember to be good warned mother pepper the last thing when he had been washed and dressed and brushed and declared quite prepared i'm going to be always good declared joel i ain't ever going to be like abum he added in disgust joel reproved mother pepper sternly don't judge other folks it's enough for you to do to look out for yourself joel hung his head abashed well good-bye said mrs pepper the stern lines on her face breaking into a smile good-bye mamsie joel flew back suddenly to throw his arms around her neck then he rushed up to do the same thing to polly and then to phronsie don't kiss david said his mother cause you may take his throat then i want to kiss him cried joel mayn't i mommy he wheedled i don't want dave to have it oh he'd have it just as much said mrs pepper sewing away for dear life how could he cried joel in great astonishment and standing quite still say mammy how could he if i took it you'd find if you took it there'd be quite enough sore throat for two answered mrs pepper well run along joe you wouldn't understand and tisn't necessary that you should only you are to do as i say that is all so joel ran off waving a good-bye to david and since he was not allowed to kiss him he gave a rousing hooray which delighted little davy greatly as he stood his face pressed to the window to see him go once within mrs beebe's home it was enchantment enough it was a good afternoon for the shoe business mr beebe having two customers one of them was a very fussy woman who had a small boy in charge joel was in high glee at being called upon to help lift down ever so many boxes until pretty near every shoe in stock was tried on mrs beebe kept coming out of the little parlor at the back of the shop and saying ain't you through you with joel yet pa all of which made joel feel very important indeed and almost decided him to keep a shoe shop when he grew up instead of being a stagecoach driver no said mr beebe shortly i ain't through with him ma he's a master hand at getting them boxes down hain't you got a pair a little mite broader across the toes said the woman stand up and stamp in em johnny so johnny stood up and stamped in the new shoes real hard said his mother 
so he stamped real hard i'd rather have another pair a mite broader said the woman discontentedly i showed you some broader ones said old mr beebe well joel my boy you'll have to climb up and hand down that box up in the corner perhaps some of those will suit so joel who wished he could be there every day in the year and that the woman would all the time bring in boys who wanted different shoes from any that mr beebe had climbed up like a squirrel and brought the box to mr beebe now marm said the shoe storekeeper deftly whipping a good roomy pair i guess these are about what you want then he laughed cheerily no they ain't either said johnny's mother snappishly taking them and viewing them critically they're big as all outdoors mr beebe well he wants em to wear outdoors don't he said mr beebe so i guess they'll suit at last well they won't said the woman and you needn't try em on johnny they're a sight bigger than they orter be i guess i can tell soon's i see a shoe can't joel come now pa asked old mrs beebe presenting her cap border in the doorway again it was quite fine with new pink ribbons which she had put on because she had company yes pretty soon ma replied her husband quite worn out well i'm sure i'm sorry i can't suit you marm turning to the woman but i honestly can't for i've shown you every shoe in my shop here joel will begin and pack em up again he said sorting the pears out from the pile on the counter that ran across the side of the shop and slinging them by the string that tied them together over his arm i'll see that pair said the woman suddenly touching one as it dangled over mr beebe's arm all right marm said mr beebe most obligingly so he knelt down before johnny again and pulled on the shoes and johnny's mother told the boy to stand up and stamp in em all of which was performed and old mr beebe got up and pulled out his bandana and wiped his hot face now that's something like said the woman with a bob of her head while her little eyes twinkled i guess i know the right shoe as well as the next one why didn't you show em to me before she snapped you've had them shoes on twice before said mr beebe or at least the boy has first they were too broad and then they were too narrow well i'll take em anyway now said the woman laying down the money and i guess i know as well as the next one whether my boys tried on shoes or not now joel said old mr beebe when the little green door with its jangling bell had really closed on her and on johnny as soon as we get these shoes back again in the boxes you better run into the parlor cause ma had been awaitin considerable joel much divided in his mind whether he would rather stay in the shop altogether with the delightful shoes or go out and spend half of the time with mrs beebe and the doughnuts and the pink and white sticks he felt almost sure were waiting for him came to the conclusion that he really couldn't decide which was the more delightful and then the shop door bell jangled again and there was another customer this time it was a little thin old man and although he came from another town he seemed to be a great friend of mr beebe's who now joyfully welcomed him well i declare if taint obadiah andrews exclaimed the shoe shopkeeper radiantly taking a good look at the newcomer i haven't seen you for a week of sundays obadiah nor i hain't seen you declared the little man just as well pleased and sitting down gladly i'm most beat out a gettin here so i want some new shoes jotham and i calculate i'll get em about as nice as they make em here i calculate so too obadiah said old mr beebe rubbing his hands together in a pleased way now joel we'll get down all the shoes on this side and he ambled across the shop and you can put up the boys sizes afterwards if you want to pa ain't you most through with joel oh why here's mr andrews exclaimed mrs beebe then she came into the little shop and sat down while mr beebe and joel got out the shoes that were to be tried on it's so nice that i can pass the time of day with you meanwhilst she observed but it didn't take very long to satisfy old mr andrews as soon as the first shoe was pulled on he declared it was just right although the shoe shopkeeper offered to try on the others perhaps these will pinch when you get home suggested mr beebe anxiously or something else as bad will be the matter with them but the little old man said no do em up jotham so the shoes were rolled in paper and tied with a red string and then mr obadiah andrews said now i'm a-goin to set and visit and pass the time o day with ye jotham so do cried old mr beebe delightedly counting out the change now joel you can pile all them shoes back and then finish the boy sizes if you want to and after that ma he can go into the parlor and be company to you when mrs beebe and joel finally got into the parlor leaving the two old friends talking busily there only remained ten minutes before it was time to go home 
oh dear me exclaimed old mrs beebe quite aghast as she glanced at the clock well you must obey your ma and the only thing i see out of it is you must come again so she stuffed into a paper bag all the pink and white sticks and doughnuts that were piled so nicely in a company fashion on a blue plate there she said smothering her disappointment as best she could take these home with you and tell your ma i expect you again some day we can't help it cause pa's been so busy as joel ran off i've sold shoes all the afternoon he screamed rushing into the little brown house and for a moment forgetting the paper bag and its precious contents then it came ever him in a burst look at this swinging it over polly's brown head she bobbed it up suddenly look out screamed joel but too late polly's brown head bumped into the bag and away it spun and the doughnuts and the pig and white sticks went flying all over the kitchen floor now that's too bad cried polly jumping up to help pick them up oh joel what a perfectly splendid lot ain't it said joel his mouth watering to begin on them here's one more spying a pink stick behind mamsie's chair here tis i've got it emerging in triumph and holding it fast where's phronsie and dave over at grandma's said polly oh dear began joel then he thought a minute i'm going to take grandma a doughnut polly he cried dancing off and swinging the bag into which he had crammed all the goodies he heard phronsie singing to grandma which she was very fond of doing and perched up on the side of the bed grandma smiling away as well pleased as though she heard every word dave screamed joel bounding in and swinging the bag you don't know what i've got and he hopped up on the bed between grandma and phronsie when davy saw that he got out of his chair and speedily hopped up on to the bed too grandma laughed till the tears rolled down her cheeks i guess you'll laugh more yet grandma declared joel untwisting the top of his bag and bringing a pair of bright black eyes very close to it to peer within it's perfectly splendid he cried holding his hand so no one else could see oh joey do show us cried phronsie getting up to kneel on the patched bed quilt to look over his arm you may take one peek decided joel suddenly bringing his eyes away from the mouth of the bag to gaze at them grandma must have the first one then you must guess what it is i guess it's doughnuts said little davy cause you've been to mrs beebe's and besides i smell em grandma smiled all the time just as happily as if she had heard everything that had been said there's something else said joel emphatically but tisn't your guess now grandma he held the bag close up to the old lady's cat border look my exclaimed the old lady what you got joel as he twitched away the bag didn't you see cried joel well you may have one more peek cause you are grandma and he brought it up again before her eyes doughnuts said grandma my sakes where'd you get em you may have one said joel peering into the depths of the bag to fish out a good-sized one that was sugary all over which he dropped in her hands give me one begged phronsie holding out both hands in a minute said joel now grandma what else is in here giving the bag a shake hey asked grandma speak louder joel oh dear me i can't speak so she'll hear said joel in despair to the others so he shook the bag again when the bottom of it came out and away the doughnuts and pink and white sticks flew and rolled all over the patched bed quilt there now said joel in disgust there isn't any use in anybody's guessing anything but we can eat em now he added brightening End of chapter 25